record. So I'm just letting everybody in the meeting know that uh, we are going to have a recorded lecture, which is super duper. It means we can keep it forever and ever. And um, I'm going to just, just do a little bit of housekeeping announcements about how the lecture will go before I hand over to our student MC. And that is Christian for the, the evening. The so um, we're not using the chat bar for questions later on. Um, save your questions and you can put your hand up. And when um, Matt pauses, because he does pause when he speaks, uh, he might say he might ask you a question, then put your hand up if you want to answer and I'll I'll name you and just come off the mic and speak. Yeah. Uh, there might be people wandering in as we talk because the lobby door is open. That's fine. It doesn't bang shut. So we're in luck. And without further ado, I am going to ask you just to keep your mics off until you're asked to speak. And uh, that's the only rule. And I'm going to hand over to Christian. Uh, thank you, Miss Trafford. It's my pleasure today to be introducing today's guest award-winning author and filmmaker, Mac Dickinson, who has made documentaries for National Geographic Television, the Discovery Channel and the BBC. However, the most shocking event occurred over 29,000 feet high with a blizzard and eight deaths at the summit of Mount Everest in 1996. This will be very interesting to hear as it was a survival against the odds, a survival against the odds. Uh, take it away, Mac Dickinson. What a great introduction. Thank you very much indeed. And it's an absolute pleasure to be the first speaker in your speaker program for Cambridge Homeschool Online. Um, it's an honour and a privilege to be with you here today. And I know that many of you are in uh, you know, other parts of the world, even Australia, I think our MC was perhaps introducing from there. We've got, I know pupils in Istanbul, we've got pupils in the Middle East, we've got pupils in Africa, we've got pupils all over Europe and also Asia and China as well. So it's an absolute pleasure to be talking to such a sophisticated global audience, uh, which is a great pleasure for me, so I'm delighted. And I wanted to start with this image here. We see a tiny little figure. I hope you can see that little figure standing at the bottom of the peak. It's not Everest. It's one of the small mountains, the titchy mountains, the tiny mountains on the way to Mount Everest. But it's a good picture because it shows us a sense of scale. And if we say scale, we mean, you know, our size relative to the challenge. And I wonder if you can imagine how that tiny little figure would feel. How would you feel if it was actually you standing at the bottom of the mountain? Have you ever had a dream of your own? Have you got an ambition of your own? It may not be a mountain challenge, but it might be something which involves a lot of struggle or a lot of learning or a lot of um, enterprise and commitment. And that is the biggest part of it, I think, is the resilience to keep going when conditions change against you. And we're going to be talking quite a lot about that in the course of this presentation. So this is a presentation which is about mountains, but at the same time, I hope that you will begin to appreciate it's about a, a whole lot more as well, because I, I hope that this presentation will help you to focus on your dreams, whatever they may be. Now, my ambition when I was younger, I really got interested in writing. I got interested in making films and I wanted to be a filmmaker, really. And, and I wonder if any of you have got a similar ambition. Perhaps in the future, you'd like to make wildlife documentaries. Perhaps you'd be interested to be a scriptwriter writing movies. Maybe you'd like to direct something like a Netflix series or, or something like a Lord of the Rings. You know, these are great ambitions and it's wonderful to work in the media. Now, you are uniquely well placed to work in the media uh, with your international profile because I'm sure that all of the pupils at your school have a global mindset. And that's a very valuable thing if you want to work in the media, understanding that the world is not just your little town or your little, you know, the area around where you live. The world has so much to teach us and we can learn so much. But we need to have that global mindset. So the most successful people in the world of media, I think, are people which think outside of their own neighbourhood and they appreciate that we need to understand the way that other parts of the world interact and um, uh, and operate. 
So Everest is a great draw. People come from all over the world. And we're talking about every possible uh, background of race and culture and religion, men and women come to Everest and, and they've got so many different motivations. Now, when we say motivation, what do we mean? Well, we mean something very personal. Motivation is a question of personal ambition. And some people would regard the ambition of climbing to the summit of Mount Everest as completely ridiculous, totally mad. And why on earth would anybody want to do that? And I get it because it is potentially a life threatening project. But men and women from every background and every nationality have a desire to achieve in their lives. And some of them have an ambition to climb to the summit of Mount Everest. So it's remarkable to think that uh, men and women from virtually every country on the planet have actually been to the summit of Everest. And that's a great thing. So here is the mountain. And I love to start with this picture because this is actually Mount Everest, 8,848 meters high. What an incredible, powerful testament to nature and the power of nature to, to, to form these extraordinary landscapes. And when you think of how high this mountain is, you know, not just is it the highest mountain in the world, it's one of the most fascinating mountains in the world because it was formed by the collision of two tectonic plates uh, 75 million years ago. They've been creaking, cracking, crunching against each other, pushing and thrusting the whole of the Himalayan mountain range, which is the greatest mountain range on the planet. And I hope that you will have a chance to go to the Himalayas, go and do a gap year project before you go on to your I think you're on mute. Hang on, I will just let Mr Dickinson know that his camera is off. Two seconds. Your mic's off. He's just trying again. He's going to try on his phone and try and get back in. Not quite sure why that's happened. Let me see if I can. Yeah. We did. Yeah, let me try again. And excellent. How about now? Brilliant. Good. OK, um, I've, yeah, that's that's unusual. That happened. Um, I, I'm not sure what's happened with the sound. Could you continue to see the picture at that point? Yeah. Yeah. OK, um, so uh, I'll continue with the pictures in a moment. But first, I wanted to. Uh, to He's been muted again. He has. Yeah. Do you know what? Something I'm wondering. Him. If someone might have done that. Ah, uh, OK, right. Yeah, OK. The, I think you could be right, Mrs Trafford. I think someone perhaps accidentally has accidentally muted you. my... I muted. will just have a little look at the, the options and make yeah, sure that can't happen. I think you can um, actually... I think somebody um, is like not attendee. If you... Yeah. Yeah. Use this there's an option to mute someone. I'll just change in the options. Yeah, so okay. that all students can mute or have all the things. Teachers should make all students attendees, so they can stop muting. You know them. Yeah. Right. Um. So shall I continue, Mr. Trafford? Yes, um, please. Uh, because um, I I wanted to mention that some people go to Mount Everest on their own. Obviously, most people are going with a team and that team has, is going to give you support. And if we think about the advantages of being with a team, I'm sure that you could come up with plenty of ideas. But but let me just make a few suggestions. You know, you're going to get the support of your fellow teammates. You've got the input of a leader 
and a leader is going to make potentially tough decisions for you and help you to stay safe and also achieve your dreams within the, the, the structure of the team. So being a part of a team has many clear advantages. But some people love to do these challenges and go to the mountains on their own. And I wonder what type of person you would think you are and what would be the advantages of being a solo type of person? Um, let's have a couple of, uh, of responses from our uh, delegates, please, Mrs. Trafford. What do you think would be the advantages of going to be a solo climber? Uh, what could be the reasons why some people would love to do that? Put up your hand and let's have a little um, a couple of suggestions from okay. our delegates here today. We've got Daniel. Daniel, um, what do you think? Uh, I think because you won't have to spend as many resources. That's a good on, point, Bri. I'm just yeah. going up. Yeah, I'm, that's I'm, a very good I, point. Yeah, it's a very it's a it's a streamlined much much cheaper you know the cost of an expedition could be millions and millions of dollars but if you just went on your own you could probably do it for fifty thousand dollars he thought that up i don't know uh yeah what I'm, advantages i'm matthew are. we're just on the same computer yeah. right now yeah yeah very good. Yeah, nice to see you. Uh, greetings and uh, nice to, to link up with you. That's an excellent answer. Um, what about psychologically? Do you think it might be challenging to be on your own on a dangerous mountain? Yeah. Very. Oh, yeah, it definitely Absolutely. can be. Please and would you, like would you rather go with a team? There's no one to catch uh, you. I would, would rather, rather go with a team if I was trying. But you'd get the yeah. recognition. Yeah. yeah. Very good. <laughs> That's excellent. That's a very good. Has anyone they'd rather go with a team or, or on their own? Let's find someone else, Mr. Trafford, who you think might be interesting to uh, to win. Win. I think had his hand up. Yes, I may. I may want to go solo because I can achieve something by myself, not with somebody else. Answer. Yeah. And of course, if you go solo, you get all of the glory. You, you're the one that's achieved this incredible thing. That doesn't take away from you. You're not sharing the glory with anybody. And for some people, that's very attractive. So that's an interesting thing to think about right at the start of our journey. Now, I'm going to um, uh, share the uh, PowerPoint again. And we're going to have a little think about uh, Everest again. And hopefully you'll be able to see these images. Mrs. Trafford, can you just confirm to me that you can see the, the mountain in the screen there again? OK. OK, good. So um, one thing I wanted to to mention about uh, about challenges like this, obviously climbing mountains is a sport. Well, there's another sport which has a very interesting uh, mentality from this protagonist, and that's Floyd Mayweather. And he says that his success to become world um, champion in his sport, which is boxing, has is all about brain, chin and heart. Now, I think this is very, very interesting. I think fairly clearly what we mean by brain is you've got to have a plan. You've got to think about it. You've got to have a strategy, haven't you? Then the second part is chin. Now, let's have some answers from our pupils, please, Mrs. Trafford, if you could choose them for me. What do you think this top sports person means by chin? What, what, are, what are the qualities that he's getting at there in his assessment to become a world champion? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I think that it could possibly just mean stride or kind of carrying yourself. Yep, that's a, a, a very good, um, very good answer. I think you're you're heading in the right direction there. Anybody else got any other suggestions? Obviously, in boxing, it's going to be that you know you're you're going to get hit on the chin, aren't you? So so why does he think that's a, a part of the pathway to to being successful? Arabella, Arabella. Maybe to like keep your head up high and like not fall back down. Very good, because you're hinting at something there, Arabella, which is, I think, what he may be meaning, which is um, resilience. You are going to be, you know, you're going to, it's going to be hard physically to become a boxer and you need a, a tough strong chin and and you need to be prepared to get you know actually your opponent is going to land some blows so this is a very important part of success 
because we, we, we no one's going to have a clear pathway to success, least of all a boxer or a mountaineer. You know, so that's what he means by that. He means brain. You've got to have a plan. He means chin. You've got to have the, um, the awareness that it's not going to be easy and you are going to suffer some blows along the way which you have to resist and be resilient. And then what does he mean by heart in the last part of that statement? What does he mean by heart? Let's have another pupil, please, Mr. Trafford, to, uh, to help us with that one. Anya, what do you think? Mm, I think that it could mean like passion and like of the passion of doing what you like and what motivates you. Yeah, very, very good indeed. Well done, Anya. You've hit it exactly 100%. That's surely what he means. It's the passion. And that passion is, is the key to your success. And I wish every single one of you, all of the pupils at Cambridge Homeschool Online, every possible success in the future. And the key to your success will be your passion. It will be you looking at yourself and realising this is what you really want to do. And so that's why I think that's a, a very interesting statement. Now, the youngest person to climb Mount Everest is this remarkable girl. Her name is Malavath Purna. She's from India. And um, a few years ago now, she climbed Everest at the age of 13. She was 13 years old. Now, how incredible is that? And uh, when we look at her achievement, we have to really applaud a fantastic effort by her. Not only you know, does she come from a country where um, it wasn't easy for her to find sponsors and the money that you need to go to Mount Everest, but she managed to do that in India, which was a great achievement. She managed to convince people that she would be the one to, to reach the summit. And so she has reached the summit of Everest at the age of 13. And a 13 year old boy has also reached the top. But recently, and here we get very scary, an 11 year old boy has said that he is going to reach the top of Mount Everest and get back alive before his 12th birthday. Now, I wonder what you think about that. Do you think that's a good idea and it's fine that an 11 year old should be allowed to risk his life with avalanches, storms, marauding yetis? He could fall into a crevasse. He could be um, he could get altitude sickness, which we'll mention in a short while a bit more. Um, is it right that an 11 year old should be allowed to risk his life on the highest mountain in the world? Let's find somebody new, Mrs. Trafford, with an opinion about that. I'd be fascinated to know your opinion, pupils at Cambridge Homeschool Online about that subject. Is it right that an 11 year old boy should be allowed to try and reach the top of Mount Everest? A teacher, what do you think? Ah, uh, hello. Yes. Regarding the matter of the 11 year old, I think that if he has the proper equipment, he has the brain, chin, heart analogy we were talking about. I see no reason as to why he can't do it as a 13 year old girl did it. I think as humans progress and evolve, the younger you are, the higher your skill set increases. What an absolutely fantastic answer. I, I really uh, I'm impressed with that. Well done indeed. Has anybody got an opposing view? Perhaps one of our teachers who's attending would like to comment. Any opposing views? Any teacher thoughts? Yes, go for it, ma'am. Is that are you talking to me? I am, yes. Uh, well, I've got an 11, 11 year old son who has just started secondary school. I've got to say, not a chance, mum, I'd like to climb Mount Everest. So, son, not this year. Um, it did here. I think you're fab and I think your answer was great. But in reality, um, I wouldn't allow him to risk his life so young. I think he's got more life in him. And I, I admire his courage and possible resilience, but not quite at 11. That, yeah, that's from that's... me point of view. Yeah, that's a very, a very interesting point of view to uh, to give the counterpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Miss, for that. Now, obviously, Everest is not the only mountain and the Himalayas is not the only mountain range. We find mountains all over the world. And I have had the good fortune to visit many of these mountain ranges. In fact, I've actually visited all of them. And uh, I've filmed in Antarctica. I've had a chance to go to North America, Africa, South America to climb Aconcagua, which is the highest peak in the Americas and in Southeast Asia and the Alps as well. And I hope that in the future you will have a chance to visit and to enjoy mountains because you will ultimately learn a lot about yourself. 
Now, in recent years, Everest has become very controversial. For those of you with English as a second language who may have recently joined the school, if we say something is controversial, we really mean it's a, you know, it's a subject on which not everybody agrees. It's a subject that people are a little bit scandalised. It means that there's something at the heart of it which feels not quite right. And Everest has become very controversial. Now, the reason is because lots of people die. Every year, sadly, people lose their lives. And not just that, there are many other issues which have made Everest into a controversial mountain. Now, when we look at the, the rate of death, many of you will be scientists. Many of you will have a, the minds of statisticians, of mathematic geniuses that you undoubtedly are or will be in the future. And here we see in this graph um, some very clever Matt. analysis. Yes? Sorry, sir. Um, I think when we, you were muted earlier on, when we've now got a very small version of your slide. So I'm wondering if it's worth not sharing, then sharing again. Yeah, OK. I can and certainly. seeing if they come up a little bit uh, better. I can I certainly. I think that's right, everyone, isn't it? We're seeing them a little bit small. Yeah, OK, fine. So no, I've, uh... not for me. It's for me. You've seen oh. them big? Yeah. OK. Oh, if it's just me, then carry on as before. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> put me, my it's mic also, on. You know. Yeah, and uh, how about you, Mrs. Graham? Can you see the image? Um, have you been seeing the image big or, or not? Right, let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint. I'll bring it up again, Mrs. Trafford, just to check. Um, just to reassure everybody, these types of technical challenges, these do happen uh, quite commonly with, with teams. And uh, so it's not the first time that this type of thing has happened. How, is that bigger in your screen now, Mrs. Trafford? It, it's I, not bad. We can't read the writing. Oh, OK. Right. Well, let me um, let me tell you what's what's happening here. So the um, the the graph shows us how many people die on Mount Everest compared to every hundred successful ascents. And it turns out that for every hundred people who have successfully reached the top of Mount Everest and got back alive, four people have lost their lives. Now, what I'd like to ask our pupils here today is, you know, obviously I'm guessing that probably none of you are actually mountaineers, but you may be the type of risk taking mentality that you'd think, oh, I'd like to have a go. So let's find out a show of hands. How many of our delegates in this presentation here today at Cambridge Homeschool online in your wonderful places all over the world, how many of you would willingly take that risk, a 4% chance that you are never going home again to reach the summit of Mount Everest? And that is the statistical certainty of a journey to Everest. So let's have a show of hands. And if you can relate back to me, Mrs. Trafford, um, put up your hand if you feel you would take that risk. I'm going to have to go all the way down here. It's going up and up and up. I'm at 10, 11 hands up. Uh, and my hand is down, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to the summit. Okay. Uh, 13. Yeah, well, given we're at over 60 attendees, you've got round about one in one in um, six people, a bit okay. more than that. 1.1 people would do it percent sorry right. Te, no 11 percent sorry yeah that's a very interesting uh, statistic indeed thank you now everest is not the most dangerous mountain in the world um and it's it certainly has challenges for everybody who works in that region and one of the other problems with everest which has emerged in recent years is the ethical debate about the people who have to work around Mount Everest and, and earn their living. And mostly they are the Sherpa people of Nepal. Now, the Sherpa people of Nepal are tough, very, very um, good natured, wonderful, positive people. I've always loved to travel in the Everest region because the people who live there are mountain people. And in my experience, mountain people are always fantastic people to spend time with. Very positive indeed. But the jobs they have to do are often terrible. And here we see a man carrying a load of 122 kilos. Can you imagine what it would be like to carry a boiler, a steel boiler 
for a hotel which is going to be built in the Everest base camp region. And so there's no roads, there's no trucks, there's no cars. So that poor man is going to have to carry that all the way up to base camp. And you know how much he's going to be paid every day of the seven days it's going to take him to get there? About $15 a day. He will be paid 15 US dollars for doing that job. And we have to ask ourselves the question, is that right? And I think the answer fairly clearly is no, it's not right at all. That is definitely exploitation of the local people. Another problem in the Everest region is the trash, the rubbish, the junk that people have left behind. If you could analyse this rubbish tip, you would find Pringles packets, crisps, you'd find plastic water bottles, you found broken bits of tent, all sorts of horrible stuff, plastic waste that people have left behind. So that is a definite problem in the Everest region now. At the same time, um, as we've seen, the rates of injury and death are going up. And one of the reasons for that is a fascinating reason, which I'm sure your science department and your geography department would love to get involved with some further analysis and research, because there's a strong case to say that Everest is becoming more dangerous because of global warming. Now, the reason for that is that Everest is a glacial environment. It's covered in glaciers and some of them are huge, but they are melting. They are collapsing. They are getting smaller and more unpredictable every year. And that means that people are getting killed by avalanches, including a few years ago, even more than 20 pe people were tragically killed in an avalanche incident. Another problem on Mount Everest is the queues people actually queuing to reach the summit. How insane is this? This is um, a picture taken by a friend of mine called uh, Nims Dai, and he was up high on the summit ridge of Everest when he saw this chilling sight. And I say chilling because those people are waiting in a line, possibly for an hour, possibly for an hour and a half, and they will get frostbite, they will get exposure, they will get hypothermia. And in fact, some of those people did tragically lose their lives because they had to wait and their oxygen ran out on Everest. So all of these problems are definitely there. And I have personally experienced some of those problems. My fingers after a trip to Everest, frostbite became a real issue. And I was very lucky to still have my fingers to this day. But I'm always aware of what could go wrong. We have to have a very strong attitude towards safety when we go to Mount Everest. So people come from all over the world, as we've mentioned, and Everest has been very much an inspiration for my books. And so I wanted to, to mention the, the writing side of things, because for me, that's a very important part of my business and a part of my world. So um, one of the books that has come out of my Everest experiences is called The Death Zone. And this book is actually the true story of reaching the summit of Mount Everest. And this book was my first published book as an author. So I'm very, very proud of this book. And I hope that you will have a chance to, to see it and to study it. Um, it has been chosen as an exam set text in the UK. And you can actually find examples of that paper if you look up Death Zone and GCSE, you will find those examples for you to have a look at. But I wanted to cover what it's like to be an author. What is the main excitement about being an author? Well, that is that you get to tell your story. And if you've got ideas, if you've got things you want to say, if there are things that you would love to tell the world, <laughs> becoming an author is a really good way to share your experiences and your ideas with the whole of the world. And that book has got a, a photo section inside and uh, that gives you some of the images from Mount Everest uh, that we took during that expedition. A recent book that I've written is actually for young readers. And I hope that you are a keen reader and that you read for pleasure. I've been to many, many schools, almost 500 schools around the world. And when I go to a school and I meet readers, I know that those people will be successful people. And I'm very, very sure that you will understand that being uh, a student at Cambridge Home School Online. And I know the school has made some efforts and actually now has got its own special 
online library so that you can download, for example, you could straight away, I think, uh, download the ebook of the Everest Files or similar titles, and you can find books that you can enjoy. And so that's a fantastic opportunity for you. Just to give you one example of something that happened to one of my sons, he went for an interview at uh, Liverpool University for a course in politics. And the very first question that the admissions tutor asked my son was, what are you reading at the moment? And that is a very telling moment. So who knows in the future, if you've got ambitions to go to a, one of the world's top universities, you need to be a reader and not just in your special subject. Even if you're going for science, you need to read more widely. You need to read autobiographies of famous sports people and musicians. You need to be aware of um, uh, 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 current issues which are covered in books such as the issues that surround global warming or the great pandemic that we've just had. Read a book about it and that will keep you informed and keep your mind alert to the whole world of possibility which is contained within the world of books. If you do like science, you might like my title Mortal Chaos. This is uh, about chaos theory and the way that disasters can be caused by chaos theory. It's actually about a plane crash and it's a very fast moving book. Look at the chapters, super, super short. The chapters in my books are amazingly short. So if you have a short attention span, you're still going to love Mortal Chaos because it is a very, very fast moving book indeed. So that gives you an idea of some of the writing. And I wonder if the future, if you might be a writer as well, perhaps you would like to write a movie. Put up your hands if you'd like to write a movie like Shrek or Frozen, or you might like to write something like Toy Story, a classic, or, or the, the Lion King. Put up your hands if you think you could write a movie. How many here have we got? Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. 18 hands are up. So if that I'm going to do my really fantastic. 19, 20. Thank wow. you, because that makes the maths easier. That's 33%, uh, sir. That is very, very impressive. And you know what? You might achieve your ambition. One thing that, that you could uh, recommend to your pupils, Mrs. Trafford, is that they actually read a screenplay and you can download them perfectly legally. Once the movie's been made, you can download the screenplay because the movie's been made. No one's going to steal the screenplay. So you can actually download them from several perfectly legal sites which are authorised by the studios and you can read a screenplay of a movie that you love. And that would be an amazing experience because you'll see how different the structure and the writing and the content is to make it into a film. And it's a really fascinating thing which you could do in the future. Um, I'm expecting a, a wide show of hands for the next question. How many of you are gamers and love your computer games? Put up your hands and give us a wave if you are a gamer and you love your computer games. Because if you do, I've got a suggestion for you coming up, which might surprise you and thrill you and give you a very profitable future. Uh, OK, so what have we got there? We got we've, got, quite a few, we've got 17. Waving around. <laughs> Yeah, we've got 18, 18. Oh, one of the teacher, one of the teachers also. And, uh, great, that's fantastic. We're up, we're up at almost a third. I don't know if that's it's the brilliant. same third read that play games. It might be a different third. Right. Um, well, here's the news for you. If you are into gaming, why don't you become a writer of computer games? You may not know it, but computer games are actually written by a writing team in the same way that a movie is written. They decide about the character development. They decide about the thrilling twists and turns. They sit there working for months and years to develop the computer games that you love. Writers, OK, so you may think writing is totally uncool, not a part of your world, you know, nothing to do with you, but you're wrong because writing in the future could be a fantastic way for you to um, follow your ambitions and you could write a computer game, which would be an amazing thing to do. Also, you may have to, in the future, write company reports. You might have to present your writing, in which case you will need to have skills of presentation and oracy, which means that you're going to actually tell your ideas and your themes and, and, and speak your words to a wider audience. And I would encourage every single pupil here from Cambridge Homeschool Online, and I'm sure Mrs Trafford and her team are going to be focusing on this, having opportunities to present your ideas, even if they're very short, um, would be brilliant for the future because it will help you to become future leaders uh, in, in whatever 
area of that you want to get into. So that would be great. So um, I thought it'd be a good idea to have at this point a little question and answer period just for a few minutes. Uh, you could ask a question about Everest. You could ask a question about the writing. You could ask a question about the frostbite or the dead bodies or anything you like, the rubbish and the junk and the trash on Mount Everest. Um, any question you'd like to ask, let's have oh, five minutes of Q&A. Lots of hands going up. So I'll ask, um, Sal's had his hand up for ages. I hope I'm saying your name right, Sal. On you go. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what does frostbite feel like? Uh, hello, Zhao, and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be linking up with you here today. Thank you for joining the session. Uh, frostbite feels like, I mean, have you ever taken, have you ever taken something out of the freezer, like a piece of chicken or a piece of fish out of the freezer? You feel how hard it is? Well, it feels like that. It feels like your flesh has gone, gone completely frozen hard. It's the most horrible feeling in the world. You are effectively half man, half fish finger, and that's not a good feeling to have. And then, you know, uh, you have to defrost. I mean, I imagine defrosting a piece of chicken. It takes takes hours. It takes days. Um, and then you've got to defrost your, your fingers. It's, it's terrible because all that time it's, it's sizzling with pain. So frostbite, I don't recommend it, Zhao. If you can possibly avoid getting frostbite in your life, I think that would be a very good idea. Right. So we have uh, Jamie. What do you think is the most dangerous part of Everest? Uh, yes, hello, Jamie. Thank you very much for that excellent question there. And um, I think the answer to your question, the most dangerous part of, of Everest is, is the summit day, because at that point you're actually very weak. You've lost a lot of weight. I lost 11 kilograms on Mount Everest the last time I went to the summit. 11 kilos, that's a lot of body weight. So you've lost a huge amount of body weight. You're feeling very weak. Your muscles are degenerated, but also you haven't got enough oxygen. I mean, your body is fired by oxygen. Your muscles are fired. Your stomach works on oxygen. Your brain works on oxygen. Um, and so, you know, when you haven't got enough um, oxygen, all of those things start to shut down. So the most dangerous day is the summit day because that's when you're above 8,000 meters in the death zone. And the death zone is called that because, you, you know, basically you can easily you know, you can get in there, but can you get back out again alive? That's the question. Uh, Sergey? Uh, yeah, that's more or less correct. Um, was there any moment where you felt like, you know, death was directly breathing down your neck, like a feeling of strength or bravery or cowardice or total regret, like, you know, your yeah, he was still had been struck by Paris and, you know, he might not live to see the next day. What sort of revelation about life or death did you have, if any? Well, that was, well Sergio, you've, you've asked a, an extremely intelligent and very interesting question indeed, which could actually, you know, we, we could talk about this for hours. But let me give you a, a, a short answer. Uh, on one occasion, I've actually been in an avalanche. And as the avalanche came towards me, I was with seven other climbers uh, in Antarctica. I actually believed I was about to die. I literally thought, oh my goodness, in the next 10 seconds, this avalanche is going to kill us all. And it was the most terrifying moment. My, my whole body went into a sort of paroxysm of shock. But at the same time came a total acceptance. It really did. I mean, I, I, at that point, I had three children. I've now got five. I, I do remember thinking that my children would be so upset and my partner, you know, would be so upset as well. I remember a feeling of loss, a feeling of, of um, overwhelming sadness about what was going to happen. And then and then luckily we survived. It was an incredible miracle that we survived, but we did. So all of those emotions came into me. And at some point I will write that into one of my books, uh, Serge. So, so uh, uh, that would be great. It'll be a good sequence because it was real. It happened to me, and uh, we were so fortunate to 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 move, be able to move away from that incident with with injuries, but no deaths. Let's hear from Zenya now. Zenya did a wonderful poster to advertise your talk, uh, Matt. So, Zenya, you you have a question. Yes, so my question actually links back to one of the questions you asked us when you were still presenting. 
Would you have climbed Mount Everest at 11 years old? <laughs> That's a great question, uh, Zenia. And by the way, your art, your graphics work advertising this event was excellent. Uh, Mrs. Trafford did forward it to me and you did a really, really good job. So you've clearly got talent uh, as an art art uh, designer. Well done you. So the answer to your question is, you know what, when I was 11 years old, I was an idiot. He wouldn't have let me go up to the shops on my bicycle, let alone go to Mount Everest. I was completely irresponsible. I was all over the place. I was running around in the woods, uh, firing bows and arrows and, and just, you know, completely, you know, I didn't have any idea of a strategy or a plan or anything like that. You know, if you told me to put an oxygen mask on, I probably would have, you know, not turned on the bottle and stuff like that. I was completely uh, disorganized and chaotic. So to me let me go to Everest when I was 11 would have been a big mistake. And I think with my children as well, if they'd had a chance to go when they were 11, that would have been, you know, very dangerous indeed. But uh, great questions, Zenia, thank you. And I think we'll go back to Everest now, actually, uh, Ms. Trafford, to uh, a little bit more of the um, of the story because I'm keen to uh, to make sure that we that we continue our journey to, of you know actually climbing the mountain uh, which hopefully our pupils our delegates here today are enjoying and the PowerPoint is now firing up again for the uh, for the second time and hopefully we will be able to uh, continue our journey and perhaps it's even gone bigger again with a bit of luck I hope so let's have a little think about what you have to do to climb Mount Everest. What are the, some of the, the tips that I can give you? Because they may give you tips for um, being a future leader. So, so to be a leader on Mount Everest is really, really tough because you're going to have to make tough decisions. You might even have to turn people back or turn people round. Can you imagine that turning somebody back from the summit ridge of Everest? That would be a very tough thing to do, but it may be for the safety of the team because your duty is to the safety of the team. But at the same time, as a leader, you need to make sure that you've got a team that can talk. You need to um, to ask your your the members of your team for their ideas, for their opinions. If conditions change against you, you need the input of your team because then they will support you because they'll feel as though their ideas have been considered. And this is the uh, the typical view of base camp. We're going to be in a tent for sometimes up to ten weeks of our lives trying to climb Mount Everest. That's 10 weeks away from your pets, 10 weeks away from your favorite computer games, 10 weeks away from technology, 10 weeks away from movies and your favorite food. It's really tough. And obviously you've got your tent mate with you as well. You could ask yourself the question, who would be your perfect tent mate? And that would be an interesting debate that you could have, Mrs. Trafford, at the future point. What would be the qualities of your, of your perfect tent mate? Would you want somebody who's fun? Would you want somebody who's quiet? Would you want somebody who's a really thoughtful ideas person or could be strong? Uh, what type of tent mate? Or just a simple good cook who would be prepared to cook you some delicious food that might also be important. Now, when you're climbing, it's down to you. And this is a very important point about success. You know, you can be a part of a team, but you've got to pull your weight. And I'm so delighted that so many pupils have come to this session because you didn't have to do that. As I understand it, it's not a compulsory, but well done. And some parents as well, which is fantastic, because by participating, you are making a statement about yourself and you are showing the school and, and de defining yourself as a as a as a player, as a participant. You are a person who wants to get involved. And that's what individuals who climb Mount Everest, that's what they need. And that's what you don't lock yourself away. Don't reject opportunities. Go for everything because you need to, because you will learn so much along the way. Now, what I've learned is that I have a favorite chocolate bar. And that chocolate bar is uh, an English chocolate bar, which any pupils here who spent time in the UK will know, Toffee Crisp. But I promised you a bit of science, and so here goes. Toffee Crisp explodes. It explodes at 8,000 meters. And if I tell you that it's made of Rice Krispies, I wonder if any pupil can answer the scientific question here and now. Why do Toffee Crisps, which are made of Rice Krispies, why do they explode? at 8,000 meters. Let's have some answers, please. Hands up to answer this thrilling and very serious scientific question. Why do well, Toffee Crisps explode? Philip, Philip was first off the mark, sir. So we'll, we'll give it to Philip. Okay. Well, I'd say that at a very high altitude, the air would uh, 
be a lot less dense. And, and since the Rice Krispies contain in very small cavities, is what contain. Very good indeed. Yeah. You've actually, you've got. The air might actually. The pressure difference. Yeah. This might you lead to the, the air would expand. Compre You're absolutely right. Basically, a Rice Krispie is full of air. A Rice Krispie is a sealed capsule, which is filled with air. And that happens, I don't know, in a factory somewhere in Toffee Crisp land, which is almost certainly at base camp uh, or even lower, perhaps even at sea level. And so that air has pressure X. And as you go up the mountain, you are entering a low pressure zone, a zone in which there is a considerably, in fact, even 30 percent less um, air in the atmosphere. There's le less atmosphere totally. And so what happens is the air which is locked inside the, the Rice Krispies, it wants to, it has to occupy the same amount of space proportionally as the air around it, but it's thicker, it's more dense. And so it puts pressure on the inside of the Rice Krispie until the Rice Krispie actually structurally fails. Kaboom! You've got a, a, a Toffee Crisp hand grenade on your hands, could be a potential disaster. So if I were you, I would say Snickers, yes, um, Mars bar, perhaps Toffee Crisp, definitely no. Now, on Everest, all of our drinking water comes from melting down snow. And obviously the advice on that, which I'm sure you all know, is no, never, never, never melt the yellow snow. And that is a very important piece of advice, which is probably the best piece of advice that you can actually get. Now, you can see there um, a block of snow and ice, which we've cut out, and that's so we can get some drinking water on the mountain. And we're going to take a small stove with us. The weather is serious. The weather is intense. And these storms are getting stronger and more unpredictable because of global warming. And I would be fascinated if you could have a little look at um, uh, the monsoon. Have a little, you know, a little moment later after the end of this, this presentation to, to learn more about this remarkable weather system. Because it's the monsoon which actually arrives on Everest in May or early June. It comes for several months and it's actually the monsoon which has trashed Pakistan. And uh, about a third of the, the country is underwater at the moment because of the monsoon, which is a, a weather system that comes up filled with moist air from from uh, from the Indian Ocean. Now, I love my geography. I think geography is very important to understand. So even if you're not particularly into geography, have a look at the monsoon, have a think about the science of the monsoon. What do, why do these pressure systems um, move around and what would be the implications if it changes in the future? as it seems likely with global warming, that the monsoon may soon become a very different thing or even head over to the east or perhaps even disappear completely. Big, unpredictable events, which you need to know about as future leaders. This is a typical picture of a typical moment inside our little tents. And it's it's a nasty, dirty environment. We've got our little cooker. We've got our little bag of rubbish. We're eating carbohydrates is what we need. We need rice. We need pasta. We need mashed potato. We need to get those carbohydrates inside us. Now, carbs, as you know, you know, they include sugars. So that's glucose as well. And uh, those are the most immediately valuable to, for our bodies. You do need protein. We take tuna in cans. We take canned corned beef as well. But mostly you need those carbohydrates. I mentioned the books. I wanted to finally mention a couple of the titles and to show you the covers. There's Mortal Chaos there, which you may like to track down and also the Everest files. If you have an Amazon account, you could get them on Kindle on Amazon straight away. Uh, these books are out there. Now, when we think about the Everest region, obviously we're going to explore the villages along the way. And these villages are unique and they are beautiful, but it's a very big challenge for the people of Nepal to live in such a, an extreme environment. And I'd like you to have a think about this. What would it be like to live in a place with no roads? What would it be like to live in a place with no um, uh, connected electricity? How would you get your energy? Would you have solar panels? Would you have a wind generator? Would you have biogas from, from your animals? What type of animals would you, would you keep? Would you have sheep or cattle or goats or rabbits? Um, and that's the type of livestock that will keep you going through the winter when you could have six months of snow. So the economy of the local people has become very much affected by tourism. And the trash that I mentioned earlier 
is now found even in the villages. And that is just terrible because previously there was no plastic waste in those villages. But now just outside the lodges and the tea houses and the hotels, you can find these awful evidence of Western trash. And here we see a wider view of the Everest massif. Everest is not a standalone mountain. It's actually surrounded by other mountains. And they are all part of the Himalayan mountain range, which, as we mentioned, has been pushing up through tectonic plate collision for 75 million years. Now, because of that, you can actually find the fossils of sea creatures and little tiny crustaceans very close to the summit of Mount Everest. How incredible is that? Actual fossils of sea creatures near the summit of Mount Everest. That is the most amazing, amazing fact about Everest. And it shows you the long term changes that happen with our planet, uh, which can be so unpredictable, but also fascinating for science to, to know about. Now, um, tectonic plate collisions is not the only way that mountains can form. Um, uh, the Himalayas is a fold mountain range. You've also got other types of mountain range like dome mountain ranges and you've got volcanic um, uh, creation of mountains which are created through volcanic activity. Uh, also be good for you to have a little look at the ways in which mountains are formed. But obviously we're going to be living close to the ice. And there are more than 5,000 significant glaciers in the Himalayas. And here we see our camp in 2017, my most recent expedition to, uh, to Everest. And we're basically on the ice. We are actually living, you know, alongside the glacier. And you can hear it creaking and cracking in the night. We do a lot of training. We go out on the ladders. We've got to learn how to cross the ladders and not fall into the big crevasses, which are an ever present danger. The smaller crevasses are fine. You can just jump over them without any problems at all. Sometimes you will see a Yeti down there uh, hiding in the darkness, the glow of its uh, of its spooky white teeth as, as it's waiting for its next, next victim. But hopefully you do manage to jump across. Um, it does get steep. There's a lot of steep terrain. And Everest is a climbing challenge. We must never forget that it's not just a trek. There are sections where you need to have climbing skills. And that means you need to learn how to use ice axes and crampons to keep yourself safe. And that is a very important part of the process. And here we see one of the bigger crevasses. And these crevasses are frightening and they are growing every day by four or five centimeters. And so you can actually hear them cracking as they get wider and wider. And here you can see one of my friends. I took this picture in 2017, crossing one of the big ladders across a crevasse. And that's a very important moment. And then in the middle of the crevasse, you're looking down, your heart is thumping, you know, you feel breathless because of the thinness of the air. It's an amazing feeling to be in this raw, savage and challenging environment. So the weather is going to be against you. You're going to need to have strength of character and you're going to need to have uh, something called resilience. And that's what I think Floyd Mayweather meant by chin. He meant you can take the blows, you can uh, roll with the punches, you can have conditions changing against you and still fight back for your original dream. And when you see how how huge Mount Everest is, the, the scale of the challenge is massive and you actually feel like a spaceman. You've got seven or eight layers of clothing. You've got the oxygen on your back. It's such a weird, but also at the same time, exciting and thrilling environment. And you know that you are in your final days of the challenge heading up and up and up, and you're going to have a crack at the summit itself. And this was our final camp. And you can see that even here, there is rubbish on Mount Everest. Look at the trash. Look at the oxygen cylinders there. And that is a very sad testament to man's impact on this mountain. A lot of people ask me about the dead bodies. Sadly, there are many people who don't make it back alive. In fact, almost 300 people have lost their lives on the mountain. And it's sad to relate that many of them cannot be retrieved because they are too high. So there's no helicopter can go that high and uh, the bodies have just been left behind. And we became the team that found the famous Green Boots, who was an Indian climber who sadly lost his life. And he had been to the top, but perhaps him and his two friends who also sadly didn't make it down, perhaps they, they forgot that the summit is the halfway point of the challenge. So for me, what a fantastic opportunity to go on an expedition to Everest to film on the summit. And I'm going to make sure that I send to Mrs. Trafford some of my video blogs, which can help you to see more about the journey so that you can see the journey that I made in a series of short video blogs, which I hope that you will enjoy, including the summit footage itself. And this is a picture of me on the top feeling very happy 
with my uh, oxygen mask on my face, the ice gathering on the front of it. And that is a fantastic photo for me, which I was so happy. And knowing that my children would be delighted as well that I had made it to the summit of Everest. But of course, at that point, you have to make sure that you get back alive and you can actually get back off the mountain as well. That's the most important part. The summit is the halfway point. So what a pleasure it has been to, to share these adventures with you. I'd like to leave you with a final thought, and that is, you know, the most successful climbers I've ever worked with, they are people who have golden rules. Golden rules, which mean that they will be successful. So, for example, a classic golden rule for a climber would be, you know, we never leave a teammate behind. We always help our teammates to survive. We will sacrifice our own attempt on the summit to help somebody to survive and to 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 go back, get back safely if they're sick. So your golden rules could be very important for the future. Um, what would be a classic uh, golden rule would be something like, you know, your family comes first or to always look for new challenges or to always look to yourself and your own passions and interests could be another golden rule and also to always act ethically with the people around you to be kind to help people and that all comes back at you really does if you are kind to people around you supportive and actually help people to achieve their dreams the remarkable thing is that they will in turn support you and uh, help you to achieve your dreams and that's the thing i think i've le learned more than anything on mount everest the kinder you are to your teammates the better chance you have personally of success so i hope that you've enjoyed the the session we've just got a couple of minutes left now perhaps mrs trafford would like to to wrap up the session and to thank you uh, on on my behalf. It certainly has been a pleasure to link up with you all here today. Well, thank you so much, um, Matt. I think we can all do quite a bit of clapping now. You can see everybody's just been so delighted and engaged. I've been amazed at, um, well, your achievements, but also the, the responses from the students. I was amazed at what they knew. Um, incredible and really intelligent questions uh, lots and lots of them have come you know half the school's been here and we're really delighted as you said it was voluntary so that just shows how interesting they found it so um a big massive round of applause again and we don't really have time for more questions but i will make sure in assembly that we show your summit moment in the yeah. assembly because it's such a wonderful little clip and it's very moving and congratulations to you and thank you for coming along to the school well thank you very much mrs travel i hope the rest of your speakers um are uh, are great and i'm sure i've seen the list and i'm sure they will be and uh, thank you very much for having me along to speak to the school and good luck for the future. Thank you. Bye. OK, that's fantastic. I will um, close the meeting now. Thank you for coming. I can see you all popping off. I hope you enjoyed it. I was excellent. Bye -bye. Thank you. It was excellent. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, really interesting. I love the interesting guy. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And thank you. Really clever questions. Christian, I forgot to say thank you to you for, for hosting. Totally brilliant. Thank you. I had to go. Yeah, you do. It's probably very late. You need your bed. <laughs> bye bye, yeah, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.